You can turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, verse 20 through 25 is where we're going to begin reading. It says here, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord, and Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? That's the first key verse here in this passage. Verse 24, Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city, wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. You see it there again. Now look at the last part of the verse here. Because this is the key to this whole study. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That's really the question that we need to consider here when it comes to this thing of the rapture. And I'm entitling this sermon, um, The False God of Post-Trib Rapture Christians. And I'm going to use the term Christian as a, you know, I don't know, one way or the other. Now, what I'm going to show you today is that it's not that you have to believe, you know, salvation is believing in a pre-trib rapture and Jesus Christ for, to, to save you. That's not the main thing here. It's not about that you have to believe a certain doctrine in order to be saved. The question comes up, though, what kind of a God are you serving if your God is going to put you through the time of Jacob's trouble? Are you really believing in the God of the Bible? Because you see, the God of the Bible is a God of justice. He's a God of judgment. And the judge of all the earth will always do right. And he has never, not once, never punished the righteous with the wicked. And you see, this, this whole rapture debate back and forth, is it pre-trib, is it post-trib, is it mid-trib, is it you know, uh, post-trib, pre-wrath or something like this? All this stuff, all these, all these arguments can be summed up in just a few simple questions for you as a Christian. And I have seen this thing. I have been in this rapture debate. I was, I was studying the rapture issue longer than I even studied the Bible version issue. So we're talking a long, long, long time that I've been in this whole debate back and forth. Um, probably just about 15 years, 15, 16 years, right around there is uh, about the amount of time that I've been in this whole debate thing, looking at all the arguments for and against and for and against. And, you know, and these, these post-tribbers, they will come up, they continually come up, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? That's, those, they'll sidetrack you on a lot of little, little questions, little, you know, what about this word and what about that word? But you stick with the main arguments from the King James Bible here, which we're going to be going over in this study, and you can see that it is impossible absolutely completely impossible for a righteous holy god to put righteous saints through his wrath through his judgment he cannot do it you know why because if he does it then he's not god we're going to see about that in this study turn next to genesis chapter 19 verses 21 through 25 if you know the story there what's going on God looks at Sodom and Gomorrah and, and he's saying, I'm going to destroy it. And Abraham says, whoa, wait a second here. You know, and that's what we just read there, Abraham's conversation with God. Because see, Abraham knows that his, uh, I thought, what is it, his, his uh, uh, brother or cousin, I can, I can never remember that, excuse me. But Lot is down in there and Lot's down there and, you know, he's living there. And Abraham's going, whoa, wait a second here. You're not going to destroy the city when Lot's still there, you know. Uh, that, that, that wouldn't be what a righteous God would do. See? And God says, okay, if you can find me 50 righteous men, and they go on and down and down through, and it goes the whole way down to 10. And, of course, they don't find 10. So the angels come, and they, they come to Sodom and Gomorrah. If you don't know the story, I'm just kind of repeating it here, giving you a quick summation of it. If you, do, if you don't know the story, just read Genesis chapter 19. You can even pause this video and just read the whole thing. Because we're going to be starting at verse uh, 21. But the angels come down 
and they're like, hey, we're just going to be out here in the streets all night. And Lot's like, no, 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 you know, come into my house. And all these sodomites, these dirty perverts, you know, today they're called homosexuals. But I reject that term because it's not a Bible term. The Bible term is sodomite. And so, and the Bible doesn't say, you know, well, the men are sodomites, but the women are lesbians or something like this. It just kind of, if they, if they uh, lie with their own kind, uh, men with men, women with women, they fall under the, the bracket of sodomite, according to Scripture. So I don't see any other reason to, or any reason to come up with new names for them, according to the modern politically correct world. But what happens is the angels see that, yes, definitely we have to, you know, destroy this city because it's filled with these perverts. And they say, you know, a uh, lot get out and if you can take as many people with you you know to get out and of course you know all that escapes is Lot and his wife and their two daughters and his wife turns back and she's destroyed so you know Lot and his two daughters are, are all that escapes but it's another very important key thing here okay and, and and I just want to say this too because this is going to be another key thing with this whole study and that is there are times when man's persecution will come when God will allow uh, bad things to happen, and there might be some good people within that nation. Um, uh, Babylon, you know, the Jews are carried away in the Babylonian captivity. There were probably some righteous Jews there that got ca carried away. Now, God allowed it, but it wasn't God's wrath coming upon them. It wasn't God himself pouring out that judgment. See, that's the key here. That's the key. And we're going to be talking about that as we continue. But let's look here at Genesis chapter 19, verse 21. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this also, or this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither. Now look at this. What's going on here? Just let me interject this real quickly. Lot is saying, I don't want to flee out into the mountains. Let me go to this little city of Zoar. Okay. You know, I don't want to go out in the mountains or else I'll die, you know. Okay, but so the angel says, okay, yeah, go to Zoar. That's fine, you know, but look at this. Verse 22, haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of, of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Okay, so you see it there. You see God's judgment coming down from out of heaven. But the angel says, I can't do anything to the city until you, the righteous man, Lot, the righteous man, which it talks about back in, uh, uh, I think it's 2 Peter chapter 2, or th is it 3? But, uh, you know, it talks about that back there. Um, and, and the angel says, I can't do anything until you're out of there. God cannot, as a righteous judge, the judge of all the earth, he cannot pour out judgment upon the righteous and the wicked. Why? Because then he's not righteous. Then God is not righteous. God would not be a holy, pure, righteous God if he would punish righteous people you know and I mean I mean we have this just thing in, in our society you know there are so many stories you see a police officer and he'll taser some elderly person totally inappropriate escalation of force and what do people do they say oh, well, it's just the way it is then they say that was inappropriate that guy's not a good police officer he's not a good officer of the law but yet there are people who call themselves Christians and they believe in a God that's going to pour out judgment and wrath on his own body. The body of Christ, saved Christians. You see, the real issue with the whole thing of the, the timing of the rapture, it's really milk doctrine. Yeah, you can make it a lot more difficult than that. You can argue about who the 144,000 are, when they're sealed, and the timing of the different things in the book of Revelation, and, and what about this, and what about Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You can make it really detailed, okay? And I get into all that stuff, all the questions have been answered, okay? Don't think that the pre-tribbers, oh, we don't really know what we're talking about. We've answered every single question, myself and a lot of other preachers out there. 
defending the pre-trib rapture. Okay, so don't let anybody tell, oh, they, they can't answer us. We've answered every single one of their objections. But really, you don't need to learn all the little fine points of, of doctrinal debate back and forth. All you need to know is, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And you say, well, you know, I just think that, uh, I think that God is going to pour out, uh, you know, at least some judgment and wrath. And I mean, I think really the book of Revelation is for the body of Christ. Then I can tell you, you're serving a different God than I am. You're serving a false God. A false God that is so blind and so cruel in the way he deals with man that he pours out judgment on both righteous and wicked. That's not a just God. That's not a just judge. You worship a false God if you are truly... I mean, I understand there are young Christians that get sidetracked on this whole thing. They get some post-trib lying thief coming along and saying, hey, what about this? What about that? What about, you know... Look at the scriptures. Hey, I used to be pre-trib. That's one of the lines that these people do too. I am convinced the more and more that I study this and my wife, the, the more and more that the two of us study this, we're seeing a lot of tie-ins to the military. There's a, a, a lot of psychological operations and psychological warfare type groups that are, it's, it's almost like that they have a playbook. And believe me, if the Lord ever shows us this thing and, and, and the actual proof of this, you know, right now it's just theory. It's just a, you just kind of look at it and you go, well, it kind of looks weird. But if the Lord ever shows us the proof, you better believe we're going to be coming out with it and naming names, of course. But the fact is, it's like these people have a playbook. They'll all say, I used to be pre-trib years ago. Well, I used to be pre-trib and then I searched the scriptures and now I have to say it's post-trib. And you say, here's some videos proving that post-trib is a lie. No, no, no because I've studied it all in the past, I don't need to study it anymore because I'm convinced now from Scripture. Well, let me show you these things. No, I don't want to see it. Hmm. How about that? Another one of their little lies that they like to do, they'll say, um, there was no mention of the rapture before 1830. That thing's been disproved for years. It's a total, complete lie. Total, complete lie. And, you know, even if it was true, it still doesn't prove, disprove the pre-trib rapture. I mean, think about this. How many people were talking about implantable microchips before 1830? Before 1930? Before 1980? Not too many people. And yet today, implantable microchips are just commonplace. RFID tags and all this, all this stuff, it's right there. Mark of the Beast technology available today. So, you know, oh, well, I can't believe in, in implantable microchips because no one talked about it in the past. Well, that's a stupid line of reasoning. I mean, there are early documents from the first and second century, people writing about the church being taken out before this time of great trial or whatever else you have, the Shepherd of Hermas and some of these other guys writing about this stuff. It's there. Different Catholic councils, the Council of Ephesus, condemned a lot of the premillennial beliefs. You know, a lot of this stuff has been condemned. It's been talked about for centuries before 1830, before John Nelson Darby, you know, that whole thing. But the fact of the matter is, even if it was created by John Nelson Darby or revealed to him, I should say, even if that's true, it's still, what does the scripture say? It's not who said what first. See, this post-trib stuff is satanic. It is completely satanic. I mean, think about something. If Satan could prove that God is not a just God, then God would really be no different than Satan. I mean, do you think Satan is going to judge his people that follow him just the same as he judge anybody else? Of course, Satan's a traitor. He will betray anybody that follows him and worships him. But if you're a post-tribber, you believe the same thing about God. There's no difference between the wicked and the righteous. We're going to look at this as we continue. Because I know, you know, and, and of course the post trippers right now, they've already probably got about 20 comments typed out and posted down there because of course they are fools in that they continually answer the matter before they hear it. I have never met one post tripper, not one, that understood real deep doctrinal issues and is dispensational in their exposition of scripture. I've never met one. I have not met one dispensational post-tribber, not one. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. The whole Bible is, is for us. And they make a mess of Scripture. 
And every single post tribber eventually has to do two things. Number one, they have to start teaching works for salvation because that's what the time of Jacob's trouble is all about. You can't take the mark of the beast, you see? And number two, they have to become replacement theology believers because the time of Jacob's trouble is obviously for the Jewish people. It's obvious. I mean, read through the book of Revelation. Israel's mentioned over and over and over again and the Jewish people. Well, let's continue. Next, let's go to Genesis chapter 20. We're going to start at verse 1. Down through verse 11. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, now look at this, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Now that's significant for two very big reasons. First of all, Abimelech was not a saved man. How did he know then about the thing of God being a just God? and not slaying a righteous nation. But there's an even more important point, and that is the fact that the Ten Commandments weren't even written yet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. How did he know? He's just a lost heathen, just a pagan king. How did he know he wasn't supposed to commit adultery? Hmm. You say, well, because God revealed it just to him and stuff like this. Oh, we're going to see about that. Let's continue. Verse 5. Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she, even she herself, said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live, and, thou, and if thou restore her not, Know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called his servants, called all his servants, excuse me, and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. They had an understanding that committing adultery was wrong too. Verse 9, Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And of course, you know, they leave then, and of course, and Abimelech gives Abraham a bunch of goods and things like that, and God, you know, takes his curse off of Abimelech and his nation there. But again, you see that even a lost heathen before the Ten Commandments is written understands that God in heaven is a righteous judge and he will not slay somebody when they haven't done wrong. Keep that in mind. Let's continue. Exodus chapter 32. And there's a lot of these in the Old Testament. We're not going to cover all these different stories of where God's judgment comes. We're not going to cover them all, but uh, you can look them up. Exodus chapter 32, verse 25 through 30. Okay, Moses is up. Just to give you a little quick story here, what's going on. Moses is up in the mountain and he's getting the Ten Commandments and God's like, hey, you better get down there. Those people are doing wickedly. And Moses is like, you know, really? And, and everything? And he goes down. First, he doesn't really, you know, kind of doesn't believe God. But when he comes down, this is what he sees. Verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? It doesn't really matter because we're going to kill everybody and just rid you of all of our problems. Is that what he says? No, he says, uh, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him, and he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, 
Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about three thousand men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Hmm. Why would Moses separate the uh, righteous from the wicked? Because he was doing what God told him to do. I wonder how it would have been if, if Moses would have gone down and just said, You know what? I'm sick of this. And God actually, you know, said this to him earlier on in the chapter there. God said, I'm just, let me alone. He said, I'm just going to go down there and just kill all of them. And then I'll start over with you. And Moses is like, Lord, there's a covenant. <laughs> you know, don't forget your covenant there that you made with our fathers. You know, don't do that. But how would it have been if Moses would have changed his mind, gone down there and just killed every single one of them, good and bad? Because they weren't all involved in this, this, uh, idol worship that Aaron had started there, making the golden calf, and they're all naked and doing a bunch of stupid things, acting like the pagan Egyptians that they left, you know? wonder what would have happened with Moses if he would have gone down and slain both righteous and wicked. Would the people have said, uh, would, would Moses be revered today? I mean, would the people have said, well, Moses was a great man? No, they would not. And rightfully so. Ezekiel chapter 9. I just don't understand how these post-trib fools can just come into this whole thing and just be like, oh, you know, yeah, you know, I, I know that the Lord uh, loved me enough to send His Son to die for me and I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ now, but I'm going to be facing God's wrath soon. You know, and they say, well, well, I'm not going to face His wrath, but I'm going to face, you know, the first three and a half years because it's going to be a peaceful time and, and then the wrath comes after that because it doesn't specifically say wrath at the beginning. Um, what would unleashing the Antichrist be on the world? Daisies and puppy dogs and, and butterflies in the park? I mean, releasing the Antichrist on the world and war and, you know, and, and famine and death and hell following that? And that's the love of God? That's not wrath? That's not judgment coming from God? Ezekiel chapter 9. I want to read this, another story of when the Jews were being wicked and the righteous were separated from the wicked before judgment came. This one's very significant in relation to the end times. Ezekiel 9 verse 1. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Calls them that have charge over the city to draw near, every man... And even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, where, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side, and the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children, and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Interesting. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God! Wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? 
Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. You know? <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Extremely interesting. If you know the book of Revelation. Why? Because God seals 144,000 Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, Revelation chapter 7. He seals them, 144,000, in their head. And he says, Hurt not the earth, don't touch the trees, don't touch anything until we've sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Hmm. And what happens to the Jewish people? They get slaughtered. You know what's going to happen to the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble? Most of them are going to die. They're going to be slaughtered. Viciously slaughtered. Because you see, there's a lot of really stupid Jews out there. And I, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and I love the Jewish people very greatly. But there's a lot of stupid Jews out there who are aligning with the Pope. And you see these Jewish leaders, and they're going, Oh, we're meeting with the Pope, and we're talking about it, you know, peace and things like this. And, we're, you know, and our leaders are doing it too here in America. You know, our politicians aren't, aren't any better than the inept leaders in Israel. You know, I mean, it's insane. You know, Oh, let's just let's bring the Pope along and let's see how things go. Yeah, study history sometime. Not a good idea. But the point is, the Jews have a slaughter coming. Just like what happened back there in Ezekiel chapter 9. It's going to repeat itself. Only this time it's going to be much worse. Much, much, much worse. But uh, no, actually, let me rephrase all this stuff. Let me just take it back because you see... The Jews are done, and there's nothing about them in the future. It's all about the church. It's all about the body of Christ. Then what's the Lord doing messing around over in Judea, Jerusalem, Israel, that whole area over there? What's he doing over there? I mean, bless God, brother, he should be in America where all the Bible-believing Baptists are. No, no, he's over there in Jerusalem getting ready to return, Jesus Christ getting ready to return and rule and reign from that city, His city, the city that rightfully belongs to Him and to His Jewish people, the nation of Israel, specifically the city of Jerusalem. If you haven't seen my study on the, the two different flags, you would understand, if you watch that, that the flag that f currently flies in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem flag, is prophesying the, the return of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It's an amazing study. But you see it there again. The Lord says, spare the wicked. But those people that are upset about the abominations, and there are Jews out there, by the way, I know that some of you are probably watching this. There are Jews that are upset about the wickedness in Jerusalem and Israel, specifically. I know that there are some of you that are upset about that. That are upset to see people coming in calling themselves Jews, and they're not Jews. They have no right to the land. And to see your wicked politi you know, political leaders giving parts of your country away when the Bible clearly says it's yours. You have a right to the land and the Palestinians don't. I know that there are some of you that are upset about the abominations just like right there. And I believe that if you don't get saved, I mean, good night, man. If you're, if you're Jewish right now, Orthodox Jewish, you really need to consider the facts and things and look at Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you put your faith in Him, you know, come to Him in repentance and, and broken and say, I'm a sinner, I deserve to go to hell, get saved, you can leave at the rapture. Okay, you don't have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. But if you miss the rapture and you go into that time of Jacob's trouble, <laughs> you're going to have a time. You're going to have a real time. There's a good chance you're going to be dead. Just like what happened back there. But now let's go to the book of Revelation. Because that's really what the whole debate is about. The events of the book of Revelation. Are Christians going to be going through this time? See? And if you are, it changes your whole perspective on life. On the future. You see, I 
understand that the Bible teaches that I'm going to be caught up into the clouds before this time comes. And I'm going to be proving that here as we continue in this study. I mean, I already have proved it. I mean, it's already a just a milk doctrine. You know, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins, to pay for my sins, and I am connected to Him, and I'm going to be leaving before His wrath comes. I'm not appointed to His wrath. Why? Because He's a just God. He's a holy God. And I'm not worried about facing His wrath and His judgment when I've done nothing wrong. And I'm not saying I'm not a sinner. Of course I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. I'm, I know that. But what I'm saying is, you look at the wickedness that's going on in this world right now, and all the sodomy and all the other, you know, all this other horrible stuff, and we go through the list, you know, you understand. I'm not part of that. All right? And a lot of you aren't part of it either. So why would a just, holy, righteous God punish you along with the wicked? And you say, well, yes, but, you know, God will protect those that are truly saved. They'll be in some special little nook and cranny someplace during the time of Jacob's trouble where they're protected and then and they they don't, you know, they won't be part of it. Let's read Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 12. It says here and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Whosoever? Any man? Where does that leave Christians? I mean, if there are Christians in the time of Jacob's trouble, what happens if they take the mark? Well, no true Christian would take the mark of the beast. Oh, come on. Oh, please. <laughs> yeah, they would. There are Christians all the time that sign up for RFID stuff and all kinds of computer things and whatever else. They take the mark. I really hate to tell you. And when the strong delusion comes... And I believe the strong delusion mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I believe the strong delusion is the Antichrist is going to appear to be Jesus Christ. And when that man shows up, the professing Christians that are left here, the false converts, the ones that aren't real, they're going to be falling down, hitting the ground, worshiping the guy. And doing whatever they can to take his mark and have the implantable microchip put in him and whatever else it's going to be. You better believe it. Oh yeah. And I hate to tell you, there are a lot of Christians, saved ones today, that are messed up and in the world and whatever else, and they would take the mark if it was available. You say, well, well come on, bro. You have iPhones, don't you? Bro, oh, bro, oh, come on. What do, you, what do you think you're doing when you're putting your finger on the screen and you're going like this? You're scanning your fingers. It's biometrics. Why do you think that thing has a GPS tracking chip in it? Why do you think that they can listen to you when it's not even turned on? Oh, but you wouldn't take the mark of the beast if it was around. You'd be wise enough not to do that, right? And hey, I used to have a little cell phone thing, a little track phone deal and whatever else, you know, and I just kind of thought, well, yeah, you know, okay, they can track you with it. You know, it's called a track phone for, for crying out loud. I mean, you know. And, and I get married, my wife comes, she has a, a, a background in, in the whole spook world. She knows all about this stuff, the computers and the military. She was in that, and she's like, I don't want that thing anywhere near me. And I was like, come on, what's the big deal? And she's like, I use this stuff in the military. We can track you with it. We can learn everything about you. It is really bad. Not to mention the fact that things are putting off electrical frequencies and, and fields and things like that that will give you cancer. I mean, look up the articles online, women putting the, their cell phones down in their, in their bra, and then they get breast cancer. You know? Men driving along and stuff like this, and they, they put the cell phone down between their legs, and they're getting cancer down there. I mean, the things are so bad for you, but there are Christians that use them. Oh, but Brother Brian, I just can't live without it. People did years ago. You know, and I'm not saying, man, you're, you're lost and stuff and you're not right with God if you're using a cell phone or something, whatever. I mean, I know we're all on, on, you know, 
different levels of sanctification in terms of, of the Lord convicting us about things and whatever else. Some of you haven't studied it enough, you know, whatever. Understand that. But the point is, I'm trying to make the point, there are Christians that would take the mark of the beast and would foolishly worship him, thinking, worship the Antichrist thinking he's Jesus Christ. I guarantee it. And the Bible plainly says in Revelation chapter 14 that those that do that are going to get God's wrath coming down on them. How do you reconcile this? If you're part of the body of Christ, how can you get God's wrath? You say, can you give me some scripture? Absolutely. Keep your hand in Revelation chapter 14 because we're going to be coming back to that. And you know, of course, I've gotten this thing too. People say, well, Brian, you're on the internet. You're on YouTube. You're, you know, you're this, you're that. Yeah, but let me tell you something. I just want to encourage you because my wife and I have been doing this more and more and we're going to do it more and more in the future. We're going to increase this. And that is there are times you just need to get away from the computer, get away from the internet. It's very, very destructive, very bad for you. I'm doing this thing because I realize it's the best way to reach the most people out there. Um, you know, we can reach a lot of people that there's just no other way to do it right now. The internet is a great tool for that. It's Satan's tool that was created to, to implement this whole Mark of the Beast system. It's, it's basically run by the military and, and industrial complex. I mean, it's the NSA and, and some of these other guys are running the internet, you know, and they're making records of everybody, whatever. But if we can get the truth into this system and get it disseminated to people and get, and then they can take it off of their computer and put it on external hard drives or DVDs or whatever else, the information can disseminate that much quicker that way. But believe you me, if the Lord told me, if the Lord was like, I don't want you on that thing anymore and, and there was no more open door for ministry, bye-bye, Internet. <laughs> but let me continue. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Keep in mind what we just read in Revelation 14 there. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, I've told this story before, but I'm going to repeat it one more time just to drive the point through. And that is, years and years ago, I was on eBay, and I saw a used motorcycle. It was a very inexpensive motorcycle, a KLR650 Kawasaki, on off road kind of a deal. And I had been researching and researching, trying to find one of these things. And it was a really good deal. I bid on it. I won the auction. But the problem was, it was down in West Virginia. And at the time, I was living in Pennsylvania. So I couldn't just drive to my local dealership. It was a four hour drive away. And so I contacted the guys and was talking over the phone and everything. I put a deposit on the bike to hold it. And I said, I'll be down in like a week. You know, fine. Now, that motorcycle belonged to me because I paid for it. You know, I put the bit down pay payment on it. But, you know, I could pay for it then when I showed up, which I did. But my point is, it was mine. All right. It was my purchased possession. But it wasn't really in my possession. It wasn't totally mine until I actually went and got it and picked it up. I redeemed it. I walked into that showroom floor and I'm looking around at all these motorcycles and ATVs and whatever else. And I'm looking at, oh, there it is. And I walk back and there's a tag hanging on there. Sold. Brian Denlinger. That was my motorcycle. It was my purchased possession, but it wasn't into my possession until I went and redeemed it. I'm the purchased possession of the Lord Jesus Christ. He bought me with his blood. Same for you out there if you're saved. Well, then I'm in his presence right now. Well, my soul, my spirit, you know, we are seated together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, or in Christ Jesus, excuse me. I'm bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We're going to see that in a minute here or two, but I'm not with him. My body's still here on the earth. I'm standing in the state of Maine right now. So when is he going to redeem his purchased possession? Oh, well, uh, partly through the time of Jacob's trouble because, uh, you know, at least if you can make it without taking the mark of the beast. Huh? And, and you know, what would scare me from going up to the, the place where they give out the mark and stuff like that? I'm here to take the mark of the beast. 
some Christian over here goes, hey, man, what are you doing? What are you doing, man? Don't you realize what that's going to happen? You know, you're going to go to hell for doing that. No, man. Hey, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, I'm sealed. I'm sealed. What do I have to worry about? Every verse in the Bible applies to a Christian. Really? How do you reconcile these two? Christians are sealed today. People in the time of Jacob's trouble are not sealed. Any man takes the mark. Whosoever takes the mark. You go to hell. No more chances. How do you reconcile that? I'll give you a little hint. You can't. Why? Because it's written to two different groups of people. The body of Christ leaves before the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, and, and I just want to make a little statement here too. You know, this whole thing, again, another part of this satanic conspiracy that has gone with this whole thing is it has become established in our language to say, are you pre-tribulation rapture or post-tribulation rapture? Are we going to go through the tribulation, the tribulation, the tribulation? That is not scriptural at all. Tribulation is merely a, a, a word meaning, you know, uh, kind of explaining what happens. You'll go through tribulation in your life. You will have trials and tribulations. That stuff is fine. But this coming time period, nowhere, not one verse of scripture, is it ever called the tribulation as a title. Description, yes. Then shall there be great tribulation. Okay, that's describing the time period, but it's not the title. The title is found in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, if you read back in the Old Testament, back in the book of Genesis, chapter 32, I think it is, back there, Jacob was the man's name, and the angel of the Lord came and said, your name is now Israel. And he had 12 sons. They became the heads of the 12 tribes. See? So the time of Jacob's trouble is really also and better described as the time of Israel's trouble. I'm not saying to change the Bible. I'm saying you accept what Scripture says. But it's the time of Israel's trouble. It's the time for the Jews, the purification of the Jewish people. And the rebirth of that nation as far as as understanding now that Jesus, yes, he is your Messiah and he's going to show up. I mean, when the peace treaty is signed between the, the Arabic people, the, the uh, Muslims, basically, the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when that, well, uh, technically Ishmael, I know is, Ishmael is descended from Abraham. I understand that. But what I'm saying is the descendants of Jacob, of Israel, the Jewish people, when the Antichrist comes and he confirms that covenant, from that point until the end, it's seven years and Jesus is coming back. And it's actually a little bit less than seven years if you really study it out in the book of Matthew because he says, you know, Jesus says about the, the days are going to be shortened. All right, because if he doesn't, there'd be no flesh saved. It's going to be a very, very, very bad time. And it's not for the body of Christ. Proven. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Keep your hand there. Flip right over to Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Wait a second. Revelation chapter 14 is teaching works as part of your faith in Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, faith alone, no works. We'll see, brother, um, uh, well, you see that, uh, you know, the, the works that we have for today, yeah, yeah. Just go and try to explain it away. You non-dispensational her heretical fools, you. And, you know, if you don't know the issue, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those people that have closed their minds these wicked people that will mock the rapture being before the time of Jacob's trouble. They'll mock it. And you try to correct me. You try to say, well, hey, let me show you what this Bible says. Let me show you this study. I don't have time for it. I've studied it already. 
Those are the ones that are, that are the heretical fools. And I'm going to be reproving one in the future here. Okay? By name, showing some of his videos. I'll let that up to you for a, you know, a little surprise coming up here. But compare Scripture with Scripture. We're not dealing with the same thing here. Right now, a Christian in the body of Christ is saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. God's the one that saves you. Okay? Not of works. You can do all the good works. You can keep the commandments your whole life and go to hell and burn forever. All right? It's just that simple. And I'm not worrying at all about taking some mark of the beast right now. Number one, the beast hasn't showed up. Number two, if he did, it would cause a problem, a contradiction with the word of God. Because the Bible plainly says that I'm sealed unto the day of redemption. I have a tag on me that says, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Lord's going to redeem me one of these days. And he's going to redeem you if you're saved. But look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 29 through 32 says here, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. A great mystery leaving and being joined as husband and wife. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 51. Behold I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You can keep reading there, you know, if you want to in your in spare time. But you see, there's a mystery. What's the mystery right now that was talked about in Ephesians chapter 5? I'm part of Christ's body. I'm his bride. And so are you if you're saved. You say, you're a bride? You're about the ugliest bride I've ever seen. I would be, you know, if I was a woman. I'm not a woman. But in, in a spiritual sense, I am. I'm part of the bride of Christ. All right? That doesn't mean when I get to heaven, I'm going to be a woman. It's not going to happen that way. It's just talking symbolically. You know, the first Adam had a bride, Eve. The second Adam has a bride, the church. Those who are truly saved. But if you're a post-trib fool, you believe that Jesus Christ is actually going to pour out judgment and wrath on his righteous bride. Oh yes, but you see, brother, let's look at this verse over here. No, let's, let's not look at the other verses, okay? You wicked heretic. Because the fact is, we are dealing with a basic foundational truth of Scripture. God cannot judge a righteous man. He cannot because if he did, he would not be righteous. You need to understand that. How could God pour out judgment and wrath on his own body? The body of Christ. We are joined to him. Uh, just like a bride and her husband are joined together. How could the Lord do that? Well, you see, if you're a post-tribber, then your God can. And that's why I call your God a false God. Just as simple as that. You don't worship the God I worship. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, and I'm getting really, really, really ticked off at all these stinking rotten heretics that are coming out, Stephen Anderson and all these other, uh, Schimmel or whatever his name is, this this loser that's come out with this this oh we're coming out with a new video that's disproving the rapture and and you know and he's destroying trying to destroy people's faith in the god of the bible because that's really what it's all about he's getting you to believe in this false god that pours out judgment on righteous and wicked people you know and i'm getting sick and tired of it because there's a lot of people that are newly saved young people that are saved just they haven't been saved that long and these 
wicked false prophets are coming along and putting all these questions into their minds and getting them to fall away from that basic understanding that God loved me enough to send His Son to die for me, and now I'm part of His body, and He's not going to pour out His wrath or His judgment on me when I'm righteous. It's just disgusting. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. You say, is there any... Well, then, you know, you'd have to be able to prove a verse, Brian, that says that we are removed before the Antichrist shows up. You'd have to be able to prove that to prove what you're saying. Okay, that's very easy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's where most of these post-trib heretics will stop. I saw Mike Hoggard, Mike Helgard, you know, and I saw that guy, and he stopped right there, and he said, see, two events, the great apostasy, the falling away, and the Antichrist is revealed. See? He didn't keep reading, just like all these heretics will do. They will yank verses completely out. They'll claim that they're, you know, I don't believe in rightly dividing the word of truth, you know, I don't believe in dispensational theology, and yet they'll go and they'll just cut the Bible to pieces and take verses out of context. You know, they'll destroy the Bible and, and cut Scripture up more than they, you know, than they try to claim that we do as dispensationalists. It's disgusting. But let's keep reading where they don't keep reading. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5 sometime. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. What's the he and the his there? He, is what we're reading about there in the last part of verse 3 and, and verse 4 there, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, he might be revealed in his time. You know why we're called Christians right now? Because we're part of the body of Christ. This is his time. The greatest time period in the history of the world is right now. The easiest time to get saved is right now. The best time to get saved with the best promises is right now. That's why there's so much opposition to true Christianity. That's why there are so many false prophets that come along. I mean, Bible-believing Christianity is the most counterfeited thing in the entire world. This book, the King James Bible, is the most counterfeited book ever in the history of man. I mean, show me any other language that has a book that has been counterfeited as, as much as this King James Bible. Over 200 new versions since 1901. Well, since 1880, what was it, 1884, the, the revised version. Over 200 new versions and more coming out every year. Why are they counterfeiting all this stuff if it's not legitimate? Something to think about. This time here is His time, the Lord Jesus Christ's time. So there's something that is stopping He... There, verse 4, verse, later part of verse 3 and verse 4, the Antichrist, he is being stopped from showing up in his, Christ's, time. Look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. We'll get back to that in a minute. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Okay? And, you know, I've heard all kinds of weird, you know, ways to, to try and get through this thing here. Here's the way it works. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Right? The mystery of iniquity doth already work. We'll read that part first. What is that? The spirit of Antichrist is already here. You say, okay, name it. The Pope. The Pope is the greatest manifestation of the Antichrist that is in the world. And he has been since the inception of the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope is the mystery of iniquity. He fills that office right now. And I believe when the Antichrist actually shows up as Jesus Christ, as this New Age Messiah, I believe when he shows up that the Pope is going to bow before him and he's going to, well, he's going to take off his crown and he's going to hand it to the Christ and then he's going to bow before him. 
I mean, think of the PR campaign they could put on with that one. You know, the Pope says, Christ has returned and he's here to bring peace to the world. And he takes off his crown and he hands it to him. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. Letting meaning they're hindering. You know, and of course it's not archaic because if you play tennis and you hit the ball with the racket and it hits the net, they say, let. What happened? It hindered the net there, hindered the ball from going from this guy to that guy. So it's not an archaic word. It means to hinder, to stop. He who now letteth will let. Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is stopping the Antichrist from showing up. Until what? Until he be taken out of the way. You say then the Holy Spirit. No, no, not specifically. He be taken out of the way. What was verse 6? Uh, might be revealed in his time. Jesus Christ. Now here's the way I have always taught this thing. The he that needs to be taken out of the way is the body of Christ. And, the, you know, yes, the Holy Spirit is indwelling the bodies of, the, of Christians, but the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. So you can't take the Holy Spirit out of the way. All right. He is letting, he is hindering the Antichrist from showing up until all the people that are supposed to get saved in the body of Christ, they get saved. And now the Lord says, okay, time's up. Body of Christ leaves and the Holy Spirit still present on the earth. But now he says, okay, I can't do anything until you're out of here. You remember, like he said a lot, the angels there, the angels came and they said, we cannot do anything until you're out of the city. Now, here's the interesting thing. Was Lot a member of the body of Christ? Could Lot say like over in Ephesians chapter five, I'm bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh? No, Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. We have a special relationship that nobody in the Old Testament had. But you want me to believe that God held off judgment on Lot till Lot was out of there, but he's not going to hold off a judgment on his own body? And you expect me to take you seriously, you false prophets out there that teach this post-trib rapture nonsense. And I'll grant you, you use your little mind control tactics on people, your little fear tactics and everything else, because, hey, again, what's the greatest motivation behind this thing of Christians starting to say, I don't think Jesus is coming for us. I think we're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. What is it? It's fear. Fear is the greatest system of control that there is in this world. You can control people through fear. And hey, let's be straight here, man. If you're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, you have calls to be afraid. You're going to get your head cut off or be hunted down like an animal or give in to the mark of the beast, take the mark, lose your salvation and end up in hell forever. You might have lived 60, 70 years as a Christian and the Antichrist shows up, you take the mark, you're gone, you're finished. That seal, that Holy Spirit of promise? No, I'm sorry, that was a lie. That Holy Spirit of promise there, that sealing of the Holy Spirit of promise, it was just a lie. Because you took the mark of the beast, and now you're on your way to hell. You see the warped system that the post-trib nonsense is? And I've, I've taken it really easy on a lot of these people, simply because I know a lot of people are new, and they get, and they get this fear tactic put on them by these antichrists out there. They get this fear put on them and you better start prepping. You better start surviving. You better get ready to, to endure to the end to be saved. And they get fearful and they fall away and they get messed up. And there's no way to get messed up quicker than to start believing that you're going to go through God's judgment when you're doing right. But now we've seen... The body of Christ has to be removed before the Antichrist can show up. You say, well, then is there proof that the body of Christ is gone before the Antichrist shows up? I was hoping you'd say that. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Starting at verse 9. 
And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. These are not Old Testament saints. These are Christians. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now, if you're saved, you ought to start memorizing that one because you're going to be saying it before real long after the rapture. You say, but, but all I see there is 24 elders and, and a lot of angels. Well, if you'd read the Bible, you'd actually see that Jesus Christ said in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now, we're going to be slightly different because we're part of Christ's body, but the point is we're likened to angels. And John sees many angels. What's he seeing? See in the body of Christ. Okay, now for all you post-tribbers out there, all right, we're going to have another lesson. You ready? We are in chapter 5. Everybody hold up your hand like that. Put all your fingers up. We count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You know what comes after 5? 6. You ready? Take your little hand and turn the page in your Bible or look at the same page and you see there's a chapter 6 there. Okay, do you understand, post-tribber? And you start reading, and it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. Okay. Now, let me just explain this nice and slow so you post-tribbers can understand it. The rider on the white horse that has a bow and one crown is not Jesus Christ in Revelation 19, even though your notes in your study Bible might say so. It's the Antichrist, the man of sin. All right. Now, this is going to be really difficult. This is probably going to give you a headache if you're a post-tribber. Six comes after five. Write that down so you don't forget it, okay? Six comes after five. You say, Brian, why are you being so sarcastic? I don't appreciate your sarcasm. Because I'm sick and tired of false prophets, that's why. False prophets destroying people's faith in Jesus Christ coming back for them. I'm sick and tired of that. There are Christians redeemed by the blood of the Lamb that are in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed. Just like it read over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We right now are stopping the Antichrist, the mystery of iniquity, from showing up. And I'm not, not saying showing up, but the mystery of iniquity there, the spirits there, but the man himself, the wicked, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, cannot show up until the body of Christ is gone. It cannot happen. But you say, uh, was there ever a time when, uh, you know, there was another worldwide judgment and God spared someone else? And a lot of you that know the Bible are probably going, I wonder why he didn't mention a certain somebody in the early parts of the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. You know, I know sometimes it's very difficult. It's a real challenge when you get to be saved and you're saved for a long time and you understand the Bible, you've heard a lot of good preaching, you know, and, and you're like, you know, Brian, I know where you're going with this and I know where you're going with that. Yeah, but we got to remember, brethren, that there are a lot of people that don't know, that haven't really been taught sound doctrine. And that's why I'm partly why I'm doing this study. And also for those of you that that get into the forums and you get into the you know and you're trying to talk to people about the rapture issue and you're dealing with these post tribbers and they just do not quit. I mean they just keep coming at you and coming at you and coming at you and coming at you. You know all I mean you answer you know they'll give you a hundred questions you answer a hundred of them they'll come out with another hundred you know and they never quit. 
Why? Because they're worshiping a different God than we are. That's why. But let's look here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 39. It says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay? <clears throat> So, you see there that Noah was slaughtered along with the wicked. They were all killed and God started over. Is that what happened? Why would God talk about uh, this subject with Noe there? And, and Noe is, is the, the word coming from Greek into English. In the Old Testament it's coming from Hebrew into English. So you have Noah in the Old Testament, Noe in the New Testament. But it's the same guy. Turn back to Genesis chapter 6. I mean, why would the Lord Jesus Christ give that as an example? I mean, you know, hey, what are the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? Oh, let me tell you about a bunch of these things. Oh, by the way, let me mention Noah. Well, Lord, it, oh, you mean that there's going to be a flood? Okay, I got it, I got it. There's going to be a flood at the... No, there's not going to be a flood. A worldwide flood covering the whole earth, wiping everything out? That's not going to be there. Then why mention Noah? What was the Lord's purpose? Let's see about that. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hmm. It seems to me that I read earlier about another group of people that uh, are saved by grace through faith. Noah was not part of the body of Christ. But this other group, uh, what were they called again? Oh, that's right, Christians. They're part of the body of Christ. So God spared Noah from his judgment and from his wrath because he was righteous, but he's not going to spare the body of Christ. That's a strange belief system you have there, post-tribbers. Jump down to verse 11 there in Genesis chapter 6. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth, and God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Them. Hmm. He doesn't say everybody, including you, Noah. He's talking to Noah, and he's saying everybody else is corrupt and crooked. I'm going to spare you. And you read down through the next couple of verses. We're not going to read the whole chapter. Noah builds an ark. Come down to verse 17 in chapter 6. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Hmm. Interesting, you know, and in fact, there's a, you know, I could make it the analogy, and of course, you know, I wouldn't want to do this because it would really upset a lot of the post-tribbers, but you could make the analogy that Noah goes into the ark and he's carried up above the destruction that's going on in the earth. He's floating up here where everybody else is drowning down there. And what's the Bible say about us? We're members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. We are part of him. We are in Christ. And when the rapture happens, we go up to the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I wouldn't want to make an analogy that like that, though, because that's a little bit too simple. You know, and the post-tribbers don't like simplicity. They like to confuse people. 
Look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. There's that weird thing the Lord does again. I mean, sparing the righteous people. Why not just kill them all? And could God have done that? Yeah. And it's interesting because God, knowing what's going to happen in eternity past, I mean, he can see everything that's going to happen. He would have known that the sons of, of, of you know, that even Ham himself, one of Noah's sons, does something wicked after the flood. Noah's in there laying there naked in his, in his tent, and, and Ham comes in and he looks and he goes, Hey, brothers, come on in, you got to see this. It's funny, or whatever. You know? Why didn't God just wipe him out? He would have known that Ham was going to do that in the future. Hey, man, just wipe him out, start over. If he did, he wouldn't be God because he wouldn't be righteous. That's the point of this sermon. If God puts the, the body of Christ through the time of Jacob's trouble, then he's not God. He is a false God. He is not a righteous judge. Genesis chapter 7, jump down to verse 7. And Noah went in and his sons and his wives and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the water of the flood were upon the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the sec second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, uh, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Hmm. So he went in, and seven days they had to wait before the flood started. Interesting. Very interesting. A little bit of a correlation there to seven years of the time of Jacob's trouble and all the judgments of sevens and sevens and sevens. If you don't, if you haven't figured it out by now, God has a definite system of numbers. And then the occultists, they try to, they, they pervert that and they counterfeit it and, and use like numerology and astrology and all this other stuff. But it's God's system. Very interesting. Finally, we're going to turn to Job, the book of Job, chapter 40. We just saw there in Genesis chapter 6 and 7 that God spared a righteous man from his judgment, from his wrath. And this time of Jacob's trouble that is coming, you know, a lot of people just kind of want to make it like, oh, it's just going to be the New World Order is taking over, the Illuminati is taking over. No, 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 no. Don't let people deceive you into thinking that a bunch of devil worshipers are creating the one world government and God's up there going, Oh no, what am I going to do? God is the one who is orchestrating this whole thing and saying, okay, I'm going to bring this whole thing together. Why? First of all, for the time of Jacob's trouble, because the Jewish people are wicked right now, and I'm going to pour out my judgment and my wrath on them, although he's going to seal 144,000, and there will be others that get saved as well. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is, look how wicked people are. God's about had enough. You can only mock God so long, and God says, okay, that's enough. And that's where things are heading right now. But you say, I'm still not convinced. I still believe that the, 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 the Christians are going to go through the tribulation. Okay? Then this might be another thing that you want to consider. Job chapter 40, verse 1 through 8. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Now look at verse 8. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt, wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Exactly what every post-tribber does. 
And I'll grant you, some of them are so ignorant, they don't even realize that they're doing it. Every post-tribber is judging God. Every single one of them. Why? Because God is about ready to pour out His judgment, His wrath, on righteous people and wicked people all at the same time. And worse than that, it's on His own body. No one else in the Bible ever had the position that we do today as Christians in terms of God's judgment coming out. And again, you know, another one of the favorite tactics of the post-tribbers, they'll say, what about the martyrs? What about the martyrs? The martyrs suffered. Yes, but they didn't suffer from God's hand. It wasn't God who persecuted the martyrs and burned them at the stake and tortured them and everything else. It was man. So I've, I've given you a very simple formula if you're out there and you are saved. And you get these people that come that worship this false God, this God who is not righteous, this God who is not a just God. And they come to you and they say, there is no preacher rapture. It was unknown before 1830. John Nelson Darby started it. And I used to be pre-trib, pre but then I had to study the scriptures and I'm not pre-trib anymore. I'm post-trib. And, and you think that you're going to get out before any kind of bad, you know, you know, just say, hey, shut up for a minute. Let me ask you a question. I want you to show me one verse of Scripture in the entire King James Bible, just one, where God poured out judgment and wrath upon a righteous man, where God did it. I'm not saying about God allowing a righteous man to go through some bad things and stuff like this, where God poured out judgment and wrath upon a righteous man. Show me one. That's the issue, brethren. We are getting out of the time of Jacob's trouble as the body of Christ. Why? Because the focus is going to reshift and go to the nation of Israel. Because God is getting that Jewish nation ready for the millennial kingdom. That Abrahamic covenant that was promised way back, way, 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 way back in the Old Testament. God promised it. He promised real estate, land to a physical descendants of a man, a physical man. He promised it. And again, you say, well, no, but God this and all that. And then he's a liar. You see, again, these post-tribbers, they're always trying to make God out to be a liar. What kind of spirit do you think is behind this? It isn't the Holy Spirit. I'll guarantee you that. But God is getting that nation ready. I mean, again, why is he sending Moses and Elijah? Who cares about Moses and Elijah as a Christian? I don't need to have Moses and Elijah come and preach to me for me to believe in this book. But the lost Jews of today do. It's all about the nation of Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what it's about. I'm going to be going to see Jesus soon. And let me tell you something. I have never met once, I've never once met a post-tribber that did not have fear. And I wonder about that and I say, are these people really saved? Not because you have to believe the doctrines that Brian Denlinger sets forth to be saved. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, what kind of a God have you put your faith in that is an unjust God that will punish you if you are righteous? Let's face it. It doesn't matter how righteous you are in that time of Jacob's trouble. If Christians are going into that thing, you're going to get hit with God's judgment. Somehow. A third of all the trees are burned up. All the green grass is burned up. Just one judgment. A third of all people die. You mean to tell me there'd be no Christians in that number? God unleashes the Antichrist and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. And no Christians get killed? You get up there to heaven and you say, what, What's going on, Lord? Why did you bring these judgments on me? What's God going to do? Be up there going, Oh, um, uh, 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 um, uh. You see the weird God that the post-tribbers have? I'm glad I don't worship that God. I'm glad my God has given me promises in His Word that I'm going to be leaving. You see, that redemption of the purchased possession is coming very soon. And I'll tell you right now, I was a false convert for most of my life. Not because I didn't find the special little system of whatever, whatever. No, it was because I was still holding on to the world. I didn't want to leave. 
I'm just going to be a Christian. I'm going to do my nice little church thing on Sunday. I'm just going to be a good little Christian, but then I can hold on to my R-rated movies and my pornography and my uh, lusts of the world and cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, my covetousness, everything else. I'm going to hold on to all those things. But I'm still going to be a Christian with it. And the Lord convicted me. And He said, that ain't going to work. Do you really trust in me? Do you really believe in me? Have you been broken? Have you come to that point of repentance? Where you say, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what I have to give up. I don't care what changes happen in my life. I need to get saved. And when that time comes and you truly are broken and you truly say, I'm at the bottom, okay, and the only way I can go is up. Things can't get any worse for me, you know. I mean, they can always get worse, I understand. But I'm saying, I don't want them to get worse. And you come to God in that state and you say, please, God, save me. And the Lord says, are you going to be willing to give up all that stuff? Absolutely. And that's why you'll find Bible-believing Christians that have problems with their families, that have financial problems, that have health problems, that have all these different problems. If you're truly a Bible-believing Christian, your hope, your joy is knowing that Jesus Christ could come at any minute. And it's a motivation. It's motivation saying, I just want to, I want to purify my life. I want to get rid of things that, that are no good. I want to witness to people. I want to see souls saved so that we get closer to that time when I get to go see Jesus. But if you're a post-tribber, what's your motivation? What could possibly motivate you? You're facing God's wrath in the future. You say, oh, well, I, I believe that we're going to be here for the first three and a half, but we're not going to be here for the wrath. Uh, you've been deceived again by that. Having the Antichrist unleashed and having him going out and conquering and, and to conquer and all that, uh, yeah, that's called uh, God's judgment. And by the way, if you take that mark and you worship the beast, you receive God's wrath. And that starts when the Antichrist shows up. Okay? So don't give me this nonsense. Well, the wrath doesn't come until three and a half years later. Hey, man, people are going to take the mark when the Antichrist shows up. And if you take that mark and you worship the beast, you get God's wrath. So don't fall for that lie either. Okay? I am in ministry right now, brethren. There's a lot of things my wife and I have given up. We, we, we just work a lot of hours and things like that. You know why? Because I believe in the rapture. It's a motivation for me. It's a motivation for us. We understand that that day is going to come and there ain't going to be any more working to do for the Lord. We're leaving. We're going up. And if you think that we're going to cry and say, Oh no, what about, oh please, please, please don't take my books from me. Please leave me, leave me here, God. I, I don't want to leave my books and I don't want to leave this and I don't want to leave that. My, my truck, I've had that truck for years. It's, it's very precious to me. Hey man, bye bye. I'm leaving. See you later. If you want to come here and steal what we have and stuff, the little that we have, if you want to come and steal that, help yourself. Because you're going to be facing seven years of God's judgment and wrath. I don't want that. That's why I got saved. I suggest you do the same. And I also suggest you stop listening to the post-tribbers. And when you get these wicked post-tribbers coming to you and saying, what about this? What about that? You know, what about Matthew chapter 24? What about, you know, I can show you the verses here. And you say, wait, 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 wait. hold on a second. Show me one person in the Bible who was judged by God because they were righteous. Show me. Where God himself poured out his judgment on someone who was righteous. That's all you really need. So that's going to be it for this video, and we will see you in future videos. I have a bunch more things coming out here, and uh, but just, brethren, as we get closer, there's going to be more and more people falling away. I mean, the Bible says the falling away, you know, well, as you fall away, you know, it starts like this, and the, and the farther it goes this way, the faster it's falling, you know. I mean, if I knock down one of these books here, and it starts a domino effect, by the time it gets over there, all them books are down on the floor. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, as things get worse, more and more people are falling away. You can rest assured. You say, well, Brian, I, you know, I, but I respect some people like, you know, Ken Hovind. Don't listen to him. Ken Hovind going against the pre-trade rapture? Drop him. Drop him. Any other preacher out there, Mike Helgard or Steve, Stephen Andersnake or any of these guys, drop them. Don't even listen to them. You know, don't listen to them. Just as simple as that. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. And I pray that you will stay in the word and not give up hope in the soon imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ to catch his bride up to the clouds to get us out of here before the time of Jacob's trouble starts. That's it. Thank you.